Welcome back, clinical problem solvers. We have a case for you today, and it's going to be presented in two videos. The first video is going to be the case presentation. The second video is going to reveal the diagnosis with its illness script. But I would love for each of you to suggest what you think the final diagnosis is below, and don't be afraid. We're here, we're not judging, and we're learning. It's a very important case. This is a young man history of cannabis use, but otherwise very healthy, who suddenly develops abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. This prompts this young man to present to the emergency department. You are now evaluating this patient at the bedside, and the first thing you do is you glance at the monitor. You see that his blood pressure is normal, he's tachycardic, but he appears to be in pain. You look at his belly. It's not distended. You listen. There's high-pitched bowel sounds like the dripping of, of fluid in the faucet. Additionally, you palpate, and he's diffusely tender, but mostly in the periumbilical region. What's his diagnosis? What are you most concerned for? I'm sure you nailed it. A bowel obstruction. Abrupt onset. Nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain really is a bowel obstruction until proven otherwise. But let me task you with one more question. Is it small bowel or is it large bowel? Make a guess and then continue watching the video. Let's now compare small bowel versus large bowel obstruction. Let's start with the clinical presentation. All, both of them can have nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Both of them can lead to the lack of stool and the lack of gas, but how are they different? And you got to learn these nuances and it really does matter because you're not going to have the CT scan results and you have to be able to be educated in your hypothesis. So this matters is not just for fun. In small bowel obstruction, they primarily manifest with nausea and vomiting more so than abdominal distension. In large bowel obstruction, they primarily manifest with abdominal distension. But remember, both can have all these features. But why? This channel, CP Solvers, is dedicated to understanding why. You see, if the small bowel is obstructed, right? Like the small intestines is what? The duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum. The ileum goes and connects to the cecum, the beginning of the large intestines. The small intestines are sort of encased by the large intestines. It's right there in the middle of the abdomen. And then the outline is the large intestines. The small intestines are closer to the stomach. So if I obstruct a section of the bowel, what happens distally? Well, stuff is not passing through. It's decompressed. But what happens proximal? It builds up. It stretches. And that buildup in pressure is going to cause you to feel nauseous. It's going to cause you to vomit the content that's in that proximal region. But why doesn't this happen in the large bowel? Well, when you go from the ileum to the cecum, there's a very competent valve, the ileocecal valve. That keeps stuff from backflowing into the small intestines. And remember, when you're at the cecum, you're so far away from the stomach. So that competent valve and the fact that you're so far away from the stomach prevents pressure buildup proximally into the small intestines, the stomach, that leads to the nausea and the vomiting. Yeah, you might have some nausea. And if the pressure builds up so much, guess what? There's two possibilities and both can happen. One is a cecum can perforate. Oh my gosh, this is a surgical emergency. That patient needs to be rushed to the OR where the surgeon's going to save their life. But another thing that can happen is if the, if the pressure builds up or you have an incompetent ileocecal valve, now all of a sudden stool can go upwards into the small intestine and you can literally start vomiting stool, feculent material. So in general, small bowel obstructions have a lot of nausea and vomiting. Large bowel obstructions have a lot of distension. Why distension? The large bowel is longer in diameter than the small bowel and it can like withstand a lot of, of you know, of food and liquid buildup. But then it sort of blows out and balloons out. In this small bowel, it depends where the obstruction is. The closer you are to the stomach, the less distension, because there's less pressure buildup and less dilation of the small intestines. The further you are, 
the more likely you're going to have this tension because you have more pressure build up proximally, you know, at that point of obstruction. So again, the symptoms, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and abdominal distension. The abdominal pain and small bowel obstruction tends to be around the umbilicus because we know that's where the small bowels are located. In the large bowel, it tends to be lower. The small bowel, it tends to be more colicky because you're really trying to, you have that obstruction. Your intestines are doing their best to get stuff through. In the large bowel, it's not as, you know, the peristalsis isn't as aggressive and therefore it's might not be as constant or as colicky up and down. One thing to note is once it becomes constant, you should be very scared. Very, very scared. That means the bowels have given up. And that means you're probably dealing with a surgical emergency. You see, the one thing we didn't comment on is a bowel obstruction can be partial or complete. If it's complete, you may have no bowel sounds, no passage of stool, no passage of gas. If it's partial, you might have a lot of bowel sounds because it's really trying to push that stuff through. And you'll still have some gas. You may even have some stool. So we talked about really the difference in the clinical syndrome. And now what we can talk about is the management. And you see, once you understand the pathophysiology, the management follows. Both of them, nothing by mouth. Both of them, IV fluids. Both of them replete their electrolytes because that's going to be an issue in both scenarios. But in small bowel obstruction, if there's a lot of nausea, vomiting, distension, NG2, because you want to decompress all that pressure buildup. If there isn't much vomiting, there's just some nausea, you might be able to get by with just conservative management and no NG tube. In a large bowel obstruction, NG tube is probably not going to be helpful because you already have a competent ileocecal valve and there shouldn't be a rise in pressure in the small intestines. So what are you decompressing? You can't decompress the colon from a tube in the stomach. So oftentimes you don't need it. But if there is nausea and vomiting, absolutely NG tube. In the large bowel obstruction, you might need to decompress with a tube within the, the colon, but we can talk about management more later. And remember, small bowel obstruction, large bowel obstruction, it's not the final diagnosis. What's causing it? Because that might also influence the ultimate management. Something that's really important is the complications. And the complications in both include ischemia then perforation, then peritonitis, and sepsis from translocation of bacteria. And these complications, if they are happening, those are reasons to go to the OR, meaning conservative management is probably not going to work. And note that for large bowel obstruction, oftentimes they have to go to the OR, meaning that conservative management isn't going to you know, um, solve the problem. Now, this is different because obstruction... Oftentimes we think of mechanical causes, but it could be non-mechanical. You can have an ileus. You can have uh, acute pseudocolonic obstruction or ogleves where you're just not having paracelsis, but you don't have a mechanical obstruction. Those can get better with conservative management. But you might be asking, so what causes them? I'm, we're going to have a good infographic that I'll show at some point that comparing the two. In small bowel obstruction, the leading causes are adhesions and hernias where hernias occur and oftentimes incisions are right there around the small intestines when you get scar formation and adhesions in large bowel what happens there often cancer so colon cancer is a common cause diverticular disease happens there stricturing is a common cause volvulus happens there why there because the sigmoid is sort of free flowing it's long and it's just vulnerable to twisting on itself you see when you understand the rest follows so now let's go back to our patient. Pause this video again. Now that you've learned the difference between small bowel and large bowel, I want you to tell, tell us, is this small bowel or large bowel? Is this partial or complete? And exactly how do you plan to manage it? And the diagnosis. Note that 50% of the time, x-rays don't show a bowel obstruction. So it's not very sensitive. And almost all of these patients, even if an x-ray is suggestive or consistent, will need a CT scan because you want to know exactly where is the obstruction and you want to know if you can identify the cause of the obstruction. But remember, just saying a CT scan is not helpful. Is it with contrast or without contrast? And be a little more specific. Is it with IV contrast or oral contrast? Oftentimes it's with IV contrast. 
But sometimes you can use water soluble oral contrast. If you have, if you're concerned for a partial small bi bowel obstruction, you want to look inside the lumen and that can draw fluid within the lumen, alleviating the partial small bowel obstruction. So in our patient, we were very concerned for a small bowel obstruction because it was primarily periombolical pain. It was nausea and vomiting more than pain and more than distension. And we thought it was partial because he was passing gas. Got the CT scan and it was a small bowel obstruction. This is where it gets interesting. There's a specific finding on that CT scan that can be summarized in this bag. You see guys, I'm trying to lose weight. Actually, I was working out today in the gym and uh, an older friend of mine came to me and said, Reza, life must be treating you well. I said, what do you mean life must be treating me well? Then he took a look at my belly. <laughs> I said, I mean, when I was younger, I would cry if someone said that. I laughed. Uh, but because I love you guys, I have to have an excuse to do this. That CT scan showed this sign. So I know you're going to get the diagnosis because you can just Google that. But what I want you to tell me, and you have all the information to get to this answer, why did this patient have this sign? And can I put a donut by my face and not eat it? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> in the next video, we're going to reveal the in the next video, we're going to reveal the diagnosis. But for the management, this patient did get an NG tube did get fluid, did get pain medication, got their electrolyte repleted. And because of this sign, they were rushed to the OR. Come back for part two.